Welcome to another edition of Intentional Conversations. On Intentional Conversations, we seek to interview leaders in men's ministries to help men grow spiritually and help leaders and pastors to reach in today's cultures, discussing issues men face every day. This is a program where a men's ministry leader interviews leaders in men's ministry. This is Mike Allen with Cape Fear Men. In the last several months, I have been keenly aware of the seriousness of screen time addiction. My son told me last fall that I need to watch the documentary, The Social Dilemma. I'm not one to watch many documentaries, especially on the network it was produced, but I took my son's advice and did so. After watching it, I began searching for books that would provide more education on what is happening in our social media world. One of the books I came across is called Digital Cocaine. The book helped me see the effects social media, gaming, and just being on our screens were having on our family lives and our culture. The author of the book is Brad Huddleston, and he is our guest on our program today. Brad is an international respected speaker, consultant, teacher, and author on important technology and cultural issues. He has worked with universities, schools, churches, law enforcement, and spoken to hundreds of thousands worldwide on both the advantages of well-used technology tools and the dangers of the growing trend toward technology addiction. Brad has an ongoing collaboration with the Bureau of Market Research and its Neuroscience Division at the University of South Africa. And Brad has a degree in computer science and biblical, excuse me, diploma of uh, biblical studies and is a credentialed minister in the Acts to a Light movement in Australia. He's also a frequent great guest on radio and television. And as I said earlier, he's the author of Digital Cocaine, A Journey Towards Eye Balance and the dark side of technology, restoring balance in digital age. Brad and his wife, Beth, live in the beautiful Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And that is some beautiful country because I've been up there many times. <laughs> Brad, thank you for joining us today on the program to, to, to discuss this. Mike, thank you. It's a real honor to be with you. And I do so much appreciate you helping me to get the word out, uh, you know, with the burden that's on my heart. Well, Brad, you know, one of the things I do with all of my guests when we get started is to share a little bit about themselves personally, if you don't mind. And, and one of the things I like to ask is, what is a verse right now that God may be using to speak into your life? Or just a verse in general that uh, really has some special meaning to you? Could you, could you share that with our listeners? Uh, yes, absolutely, Mike. Um, what's been on my heart lately and what I've been speaking about is a work of separation. We, I think revival is on all of our hearts, particularly here in America. As you know, I'm all over the world, but mm -hmm. the world needs revival as well. But America, I mean, you know, Barna came out with some research recently that said that it could be up to 20 percent of our American churches will close due to the pandemic, never to reopen oh, my again. Gracious. Sure. Yeah. So, um, but, but my burden is the technology. So the two verses that I would like to, uh, put out to our audience comes from second Corinthians chapter six, 17 will be the first one. And it says, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord, touch no unclean thing and I'll receive you. And of course that work of separation is where we get our concept of holiness. We have to separate from the world for God's use. Mm -hmm. And, um, the second verse would be from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. If we really want to see God in our nation, and in, it, has, it begins in individual lives, it says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy or to be separated from the world, because without that separation or without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And Mike, I, I, the Lord is so good. And if we could just get people to taste and see how good he is, uh, you know, we, we would we would want uh, to serve him more. But the message I have is to come out from all this darkness on the Internet and the devices and the addictions and so forth. And I just challenge people. These verses are not negative. Oh, taste and see that separation causes us to see the Lord. And you can't look on anything more precious than the face of Jesus. So those are the two verses that they are on my heart right now. Hey Amen. You know, I was talking to a class yesterday about the creation of God, being able to just look out at the beautiful creation of God and just seeing him in the creation. What a, what a joy that is to, to as you do that. Well, 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 Brad, if you would, how about sharing your story about coming to Christ? If you can give us the little reader, reader's digest version, so to speak, real short and sweet. <laughs> yes, I look, I loved it. Love to share my testimony, Mike. It's not really anything overly uh, I didn't have any major things going on uh, in my life that, that I needed a miracle for other than salvation. I was about 11 years old. I guess the only thing, really, my parents divorced when I was very young, but I was about four, so I don't even remember it. But with that, Mike, 
as you know, divorce, the, the kids are affected greatly. My brother and I were tremendously affected by that. But I had an uncle. I still have this uncle. He still has my back even to this day. I have an uncle that that met me at the altar one Sunday morning. It was an Easter Sunday morning. And uh, I don't remember what the pastor said, but it's pretty safe to say it was an Easter message uh, about the death, burial, and resurrection because it was Easter Sunday. I went forward, and my uncle met me there, and he he helped me to repent of my sins. Uh, obviously, uh, only Jesus can forgive me, but he walked me through the plan of salvation at the altar. And when I went home that day, uh, I remember walking into my bedroom and some objects in my bedroom were glowing at me. Now, not literally, mm -hmm. but in my mind, I was drawn strangely to them. Mm -hmm. And really what it was, Mike, was conviction. And I heard this small, still voice for the first time in my life because my conscience and my spirit had become awakened because I'd been born again. And I, I looked at these objects and I heard the small, still voice of the Lord in my heart go, you stole that, you stole that, you stole that, you stole that. <laughs> and and I, I I went to my granddad at this point, who also had a big part in my spiritual life. And I said, granddaddy, I'm so I'm so embarrassed. I don't even know why I'm coming to you, but I've stolen a bunch of stuff. And I, I went to the altar this morning and I, I feel like I've just got to return this stuff. And he said, I, I think, Mike, I was probably hoping he'd tell me, oh, don't worry about it. The blood of Jesus has covered you. And he looked at me and he said, son, I think God's dealing with you. I tell you what you do. You go get a bag for each store that you stole things from and you pull it all together and I will go with you. And and you tell the people that, that the managers will call the manager and you return what you've got left and you tell them you've accepted Jesus and offer to pay for it. And if they want any money, I'll take care of the bill. And I went to five stores, Mike, and, and most of them wanted to hug me, to tell you the truth, as I was standing there repenting. Mm -hmm. And there was my granddad illustrating what Jesus ultimately did. My granddad couldn't forgive me of my sins or pay for my sins. Now, right. on an earthly sense, he, he was willing to pay for those items, you know. Right, but what right. he was teaching me was that Jesus paid for my sins. And after that ordeal of repenting, that weight lifted off of me. And, and uh, you know, God hasn't made me repent like that in everything I've ever done, but he really made me probably the most honest person because I don't ever want to go through that again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I was born again, Mike, and I've had this intimate relationship with Jesus since I was yeah, about 11 or 12 years old. And I, I love him with all of my heart. And that, mm. that's in a nutshell, how I came to know Jesus it was good family members that helped me too. Greg, that, that, that is super. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting to me. There's many people who I've interviewed on these podcasts and I ask them that story. Somehow or another, the bedroom falls into there somewhere because <laughs> and, and the reason, the reason why I say that is because even I myself was in my bedroom when I actually accepted Christ myself. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so my, my old ears always perk up when I hear somebody talk about uh, some situation in their bedroom. Well, Brad, I know we're here to talk about, um, uh, your book and the ministry in the area of digital technologies and what you're seeing in that area. And I'll tell you, my eyes were truly, as I said at the opening, been really opened up to the effort. And I have become more aware of when I'm sitting around kind of bored, picking up my phone and looking at stuff these days than I had been mm -hmm. before after I saw the, saw the documentary and read your book. But tell me, what prompts you uh, to start a ministry that deals with digital addiction. Well, as you saw in my bio, uh, Mike, I'm credentialed. And for years, uh, I, you know, I've been an evangelist. And I've been a lot doing a lot of media and started a Christian radio station up here in these mountains of Virginia. And uh, about 15 years ago, um, I, I received a request from our youth leader at church. She asked me if I would take a look at a social media site uh, now, this was prior to Facebook, mm -hmm. um, but it was already popular with the kids. But the parents, the older generation at that time, didn't really even know what social media was. It was not a buzzword. Right. It wasn't right. in the media like it is now. So she sat down with me and took me through this social media site. And I noticed these were kids in our church youth group and they were doing vile things. Um, mm. Some of them were I mean, they were using foul language. Some of their clothes, they weren't fully naked but they were taking their clothes off you could tell they mm. were mimicking things they were looking at on the internet i was shocked and angered and blushed and we have a good church mike look at the church we attend is is not perfect there is no such thing as a perfect church but it's a good right. church it's a bible-based church and uh we took it to the pastor and said look we uh, maybe 50 percent of our youth group is on this social media site and they're doing all this 
crazy stuff. And the pastor looked at me because I have this technical background, a computer science degree, pretty much said, well, look, you know, you know more about this sort of thing. And I do. Why don't you preach on Sunday morning and inform us about it? And which I thought was pretty bold uh, because, you know, here in America that pretty much these days you don't deal with anything controversial and mess up the carpet on Sunday. Uh, you keep everything positive, and our pastor wasn't like that. He didn't want to, you know, sweep this under the, the rug. And so I preached a message on it, and one of the things I did, I looked around at the other youth groups where I would preach, good churches and schools that I would speak in, both public and private. And, you know, I noticed it wasn't just our church. This was epidemic. This was everywhere. And uh, the Internet, because we live out here in the country, you know, we live in a very rural area. And it, we used to think, well, that's a Los Angeles problem. That's a Washington, D.C. problem. That's a big city problem. But the Internet has leveled that playing field everywhere, no matter where the Internet is. I mean, that's why I spend time in Namibia, West Africa, you know, and, and they, they might not have food in some places in Africa, but you can bet that the children have phones. I mean, it's a crazy world that we live in. So. Basically, I went on television after preaching that sermon and did a one hour television special on social media. And that opened the door for people to just say, hey, look, we're dealing with this in our church or in our school. Would you come and speak about it? And I look, right, I was no right. uh, at that time. There was no book or anything. So as time went on, uh, the invitations kept coming in on that one topic. Now, obviously, Mike, you know me, I'm going to make that an open door for the gospel because that's the ultimate solution to all of this is, is right. the power of God to come and to set people free through the power of the resurrection. So eventually a book came out of it. I wrote a book called the dark side of technology and that I self published it in those days. And I spoke all over uh, the place on that. And uh, I, I had a lot of problems at first. My schedule filled up, but then it caused so much problems, so many problems because people had churches had just begun to adopt social media and they just begun to adopt projectors and computers and using tablets to preach. And they thought that I hated all that. And uh, of course, I didn't. What I hate is addiction. And I hate what, it, you know, the dark side of it. So after the book happened, uh, God opened a bunch of international doors, and then I wrote another book that we're talking about today called Digital Cocaine that you so graciously mentioned, and I appreciate that. That's taken me around the world I don't know how many times dealing with this subject. I'm published now. I'm, I'm actually have a, a, I still self-publish, but I, I, I have a publisher and a couple of them actually. And God has done that, Mike, because he loves this lost and dying world. Even though the body oh, of Christ, yes. this, the oh, same yes. numbers of addiction that exist outside of the church exist in the church. There's no statistical difference in the sin that goes on on the Internet. But God loves us, and He, he he's really wanting to restore us. So that's the heartbeat of the book. But in order to get free, you have to expose by telling the truth and that mm. truth can upset people, but it is the only thing that will free us. So I have a heart of love because I've also been guilty of a lot of things I write about. I think in the book, I've tried to be very transparent about my own struggles with digital addiction. Um, and I have to, I have to be careful every day, but I have come through. Uh, and right now I'm in a good place, not to say I couldn't fall tonight, but right now I'm in a good place. And I want to share what God has done in my life through the neuroscience that I've gotten involved in and, and really help people come to know the Lord. Because at the end of the day, uh, Mike, the only group of people that I've ever seen really sustain a, a detox would be those who let a power come into their lives who's stronger than that addiction. And, and of course, his name is Jesus. And that's what really we focus on. Amen. Amen. And I'm so glad to hear you doing this because of the situation that we're seeing in so many of our youth and adults themselves it's just it's just amazing when you when you go to the airports or you go uh, uh, to waiting rooms and and you look around and uh, I've, I've become more more noticeable of this myself I remember sitting in the dentist's office not too long ago uh, there's probably about 10 of us in the office and nine people had their phones out reading, <laughs> going through their phones I was the only one because I was watching what they were doing that was not doing that because I was more <laughs> more aware of it it's just unbelievable well let me ask you we, we talk about addiction we talk about it a lot of times and a lot of times we we're, when we we're talking about addiction we're talking about drug addiction we're talking about pornography addiction we're talking about these things but now we're talking about digital addiction and and uh, uh, well, I'm wondering if our listeners are thinking if this is just kind of a metaphor that we're using because it kind of they kind of relate to it a little bit more when we say addiction, or is it really truly a a literal and biological addiction that we're dealing with? 
It's a biological addiction, and it's on the same level as cocaine. And the reason why we titled the book Digital Cocaine, it comes from fMRI brain scanning technology. And then since then, there's been other scanning technologies as well, such as SPECT, single photon emission computed tomography. Basically, when you put a, a cocaine addict's brain scan and sometimes a heroin addict's brain scan right next to a digital addict's brain scan, those brain scans are nearly identical. Wow. And the, the reason is, is pretty simple. Um, th there's a neurotransmitter in the brain that is called the happy chemical. There's a couple of them. Serotonin is one. But the one that gives us joy and pleasure that's mm -hmm. so addictive happens to be one called dopamine. So when a person takes a, a hit of dopamine, if they're snorting it up their nose, instantly they will have about a 300% increase. The brain will secrete about a 300% jolt of dopamine, and it gives them a quick, sudden high. And then over time, of course, you build up resistance to it. So if you want to keep feeling it, you have to, you have to end up snorting more cocaine, and that's how addiction works. The alcoholic right. doesn't start off being an alcoholic. They'll drink a couple of beers uh, just after work to decompress. They're not an alcoholic at that point, but that alcohol is causing a stimulation in the brain called dopamine. So it's not the alcohol they're feeling. It's actually the dopamine they're feeling, but then the brain gets used to it, or it builds up tolerance to it. It gets used to it, and then after a while, it stops working. So what do they do? They drink three beers. Now, it doesn't mean they're getting any more drunk. It just means that they've got to overcome this barrier that's forming in the brain called tolerance. And mm -hmm. so they'll drink three. It'll penetrate the barrier. And it's that barrier, by the way, is simply the brain trying to get us to quit, trying to get us to stop. It's protecting itself. But in that ever-growing process of chasing more and more of that dopamine through ingesting more of the alcohol or more of the cocaine, uh, you end up getting addicted to it. You habituate to it. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turns out, the very same thing happens with our digital technologies. And it doesn't matter what the um, content is. It's independent of the content. When I hear parents say, oh, I only allow my children to use devices for educational purposes. I, I think one thing and I say another. I think they're not telling me the full truth because there's no kid that I know who's restricted strictly to the educational stuff. Now, they do right. use it for that. Right. But every kid that I know is on Netflix, they're looking at pornography, they're playing video games. Not every kid, but most every kid are doing all of these things. And so what happens is the delivery mechanism for alcohol goes to the mouth, metabolizes through the liver, gets into the brain. With cocaine, it goes straight into the bloodstream right next to the brain. Those are the ingestion points, in other words. But with digital, it goes straight into the brain through the eyes. The eyes are connected to the back of the head, and that's called the occipital lobe. And so the effect is instant. When I play YouTube videos, funny videos in auditoriums, school auditoriums, they laugh instantly. Right. And my point there is it's not like you have to drink and then wait a little bit before you feel it. The <laughs> stimulation goes straight in, but the exact same mechanism kicks in of addiction. You get a big jolt of dopamine, both when you snort cocaine, when you drink strong alcohol, and when you look at things such as pornography, social media, you get a jolt of dopamine. That dopamine, when you overstimulate, becomes very stressful to the brain, and it's also extremely addictive. And so that's why the brain scans look alike. It's because you're getting addicted to dopamine by that's stimulating amazing. the brain. That's just pure amazing. And, 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 and I have to ask this question, and it goes along with that when you're talking about that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But... Um, this past year has got has got to have increased that problem even even dramatically. I mean, you know, here in the states, and I know all over the world, but I'm you know we're more familiar with it right here in the states. That uh, so many of our schools had to go online uh, mm -hmm. to do their education, and so that just exasperated uh, our youth being on screens. Have you seen any statistics that show uh, 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 an increase in this addiction problem because of that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, this will probably be the only time you'll find the New York Times helpful, Mike. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually, when it comes to what I'm, uh, what, you know, the answer of your question, it, they are pretty neutral about this. For example, the schools across the country reported um, fewer than half of the students participating in online learning. So 61% of the students in Philadelphia attended on an average day in the online, only 61%. And in Boston, it was only 
fifty percent of the students. Mm. And so you've got this this problem where they are not logging in doing their schoolwork, but they are online. So what ha- the reason we know that is because the European Union asked Netflix to back off on their video quality because so much of their bandwidth was was taking up the internet, but we needed to use it for education. And uh, the same thing happened with YouTube. So YouTube scaled back uh, their their quality to make more room for the education. But the problem is the education ended up not being used. So the digital addiction to the entertainment side of everything just skyrocketed. Mm. And so yes, uh, it has been a, a tremendous problem. And one you know way I can tell that too is the amount of requests that I've had to answer that very question that you just asked me from all over the world, from the contacts that I've made, you know, from speaking in all these places. So the gaming has gone through the roof, the pornography use, uh, it, this has been well documented that the pornography use has just absolutely skyrocketed both male and female. And, uh, I just want to tell you one, one little anecdotal thing regarding the pornography issue. This happened prior to the pandemic, just to give you an idea of how bad it is now. I was in Manila in the Philippines at a very, very large mega church. And uh, you have to do multiple services and all this. And um, a pastor on a Saturday t- had me in for lunch to, to talk to me. And he asked me this question. He said, Brad, he said, what is the pornography rate amongst our, our teenagers? And I said, Pastor, I hate that question. Because if I answer it, it's going to sound so extreme. You know, you'd think I'm going to be an extremist. He goes, no, answer the question. I said, okay. If they have a device, it's 100% male and female. They're, they're looking at porn and most of them are addicted, but they're all looking. And he said, yep. He said, uh, Josh and Sean McDowell were just here. And they answered that question the exact same way. And, uh, I, I said, yeah, for those of us on the ground dealing with it and being in the schools around all these kids, it's definitely that way. So the pandemic with the kids having absolutely no supervision now, for the most part, they're at home. I mean, the parents are there, but come on, let's, let's get real. They go to, they, the, the parents are on, if they're millennials, they, they're just as addicted as their kids. So they're not looking, mm-hmm. they're not sitting there monitoring their children. The kids go to the bedroom, shut the door. And so we have this massive gaming problem, social media, you know, the, the amount of kids that are cutting themselves. I saw saw this trend years ago and I started to look into it. And so I even give lectures on what happens in the brain, not only with dopamine, but then the endorphins and what happens when they cut themselves. But there's a huge social um, media link to these to the self-harm and the suicide. And um, it, w- so during the pandemic, all these things, uh, not only is the, the suicide risen because of digital addiction but the isolation as well and what you're finding is despite the hours and hours and hours that people are spending on their devices it does not satisfy the heart and the mind and the emotions and this is just secular there the suicide rate has gone through the roof mm-hmm. because of isolation and yet everybody's online now i submit to you mike that the cure for that's a spiritual one and oh, it's, yes. Oh, yes. it's the need for a face-to-face interaction beyond even what we're, you know, our audience, they're only hearing the audio of this. You and I are looking at each other, which is very helpful when you're being interviewed. But but you know what would be better if you and I were in a studio together face-to-face? It would be even, this is good, but it would be even better because the brain responds quite differently. Oh, yeah. I, agree. I understand that, uh, that aspect of what you're just saying. But that kind of leads into another question there when you're talking about all the things that are harmful and what's going on in our youth and, and in our minds and so forth. And there's so many ways for digital media to enter ourselves. Um, and there's uh, through social media like Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram and, and all those various uh media types that then you have gaming video gamings that it seems like uh, people play even adults will, will spend hours playing mm-hmm. that and and getting into pornography getting into so many areas of, of the digital world is there any one thing that's probably more harmful to our brain and in our spirit so to speak than the other or are they all kind of equal equal out in in some way well they're not equal in the amount of dopamine that they produce, but then there are some exceptions to that. So let me explain. The average age of a video gamer in America is 35 to 44. It's not a teenage problem. Mm-hmm. And now, that's this, interesting. This, I didn't know that. 
35 to 44. So when I deal with gaming addiction, I start with the dads, not with the kids. It's far wow. more dads are gaming than the kids. Wow. So it, it's a lot of people are shocked by that, but that's, it's been that way for years. Uh, and, and adults are just, you know, a lot more able to hide things, I guess. Um, but to answer your question, when you're talking about things like, educational apps and software. The good news there is I've never had anybody come to me and say, Oh, Brad, pray for me. I'm so addicted to word. I just can't stop <laughs> typing. Um, <laughs> it's <laughs> or, or Google docs, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a good use of the technology. What you and I are doing right here uh, is a very good thing, but nobody's ever come to me and said, Brad, I'm so addicted to your podcast. Would you please pray for me? They're just not going to get addicted. <laughs> but what they do come Sometimes to me I and ask for would, <laughs> I know wouldn't it be that would be much better wouldn't it <laughs> but when you look at the brain scans clearly the 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 jolt of dopamine is coming through the entertainment media mm -hmm. so what you're talking so what I'll the way I address that question is brain scans first of all when you look at the brain scans by far if you look at a brain scan of a, of a marijuana addict they're horrific but what's worse is a porn addict I mean, you can clearly see where the, it, on a brain scan, if it's an fMRI, it, the color disappears. So anytime things on a, on a scan light up, that means the activity is there. Now, it can be abnormal to have too much, like with kids with autism, they have way too much activity. Mm -hmm. And so screens for them are absolutely horrible. So psychologists now will prescribe iPads for autistic children because it gives the parents rest and it looks like the child is being engaged, but they're not. They're being mesmerized with dopamine. And the catch 22 is the more dopamine you give them, more you have to give them because their brains are hyperwired. They, they get addicted at a much deeper level. And then they, be, they turn very aggressive and, and angry, just like everybody else does, except it's compounded because their brains are hyperwired. But mm -hmm. on a normal brain, you'll see various areas of the brain uh, with light there. It's lit up on an fMRI and, and on a spec scan, they're very smooth. But once a person, Mike, the irony is the more you hyperstimulate a brain, the more it shuts down. Right. And that's a medical condition called anhedonia. So after over a period of time, when you hyperstimulate a brain, the color on scans disappears. And that's how you can tell the brain is, is in certain parts, it's suffering atrophy. It's just not being used. But then that, that dopaminergic barrier is pushing out the proper amounts of dopamine. And what we're, having to do is longer and longer and longer periods of time with the digital session to try to penetrate it. So on the scans, you will see those things disappear, but the, the things that the scanning technology, the, the activities that look by far the worst would be pornography, video gaming, and social media. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, there's overlap because it within pornography and within gaming, there have chat rooms. There's a lot of interactivity that goes on. You know, I don't want to even get into that with a pornography issue, but that's a social media issue as well. So uh, when it comes to uh, education apps that use gamification, they're just as deadly as, say, Call of Duty. Now, look, Mike, I don't want to judge the motives of people who want to use, you know, gaming technology to try to educate kids because they're trying to get on that level and reach out to a site and sound. I've heard it all. The reality is what happens with, say, gamification where they're using a system of rewards to try to teach math it turns into a competition so when you look at this the stats on this the cognition or the education it will actually rise right at first but once the addiction that quickly sets in happens all the learning goes away and it becomes about the game at that point so they're not they're no longer learning it turns they're, they're trying to compete to win so using game technology has it within education has been a colossal failure what I have not seen a lot of addiction to is Google Classroom. Again, they've not come to me asking for prayer for Google Classroom or Zoom. I don't, know if, anybody, like that. I don't know if anybody's no. come to ask for prayer about education. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I can, I, what I can tell you is when you read your assignments on a screen, I wouldn't call it a sin. The mm. cognition is far lower than if you read it from paper. Now, that's well documented. Um same thing with uh, lectures. It'd be better be in the same room. But during the pandemic, we've had not had a choice. So the things that tend to be more addictive would be those hyper stimulating activities of social media, video games, Roblox. 
You're talking about Fortnite now, Minecraft. And that's another thing. Minecraft turns out that's not a very uh, highly, inter it's an interactive game, but it's a slow paced. And it was billed in the early days as a um, education game. Couldn't be further from the truth. The brain scan mm. of one kid that I saw, it, they're just horrific. The amount of addiction that sets in even with that. So just because it's labeled education, don't buy it. Um, it it's th very few things on the computer uh, that's been delivered and, you know, pushed out through the computer education wise. You, again, using gamification has been effective. Not seeing too many negative results uh, other than a lower comprehension from PDFs, Zoom, there's not been that many problems, but the reason why kids are not signing in, remember I mentioned Philadelphia and I mentioned Boston, is because by comparison, if you have a kid with a with a device and there's a video game on there and there's porn and there's social media, if you think they're going to log into Zoom, <laughs> there's no way they are unless they have a parent sitting right there making them do it. Uh -huh. And there are some parents that will sit there. And in that case, those kids are learning. And they're getting ahead of the other ones. But if you turn your back as a parent on that kid, their prefrontal cortex, this area right behind your forehead, that is the, the area of the brain that regulates impulse control. It's not developed in any of us until we're in our mid-20s. If you turn your back and they have a hyper-stimulating activity option with a lower-stimulating activity, every time their brain will go to that high-stimulating high activity and it will get quickly addicted and then that's what's happened especially well it's happening prior to the pandemic it's horrible that's why i've written these books long before the pandemic right. but it has it has been you know exacerbated and we don't know the full extent yet but but the early numbers that i've seen come in are not good yeah well let me ask you this i know we've been talking about digital addictions and digital addicts and and uh, some of the things that happens to a brain and i, I could hear some people right now say, well, I'm not addicted to this. I mean, I just look at my phone from time to time. I go out there and look at this from time to time. What what classifies somebody as an addict in, di in the digital world? Well, the, the the clinical definition is, is when your life has been negatively altered, you know, changed, mm -hmm. where you can't function properly. Some people can function, but not to the full extent anymore. Down to the to the worst case scenario, uh, I have run into people who've actually quit their jobs because they can't function unless they're playing the game. I mean, that's that's severe, but it runs the gamut. Not too many of those, but uh, a lot of businesses have suffered greatly because while they're paying their employees to make widgets or whatever they're supposed to be doing, they're gambling, they're shopping, they're doing all kinds of stuff. But the person who is addicted, Mike, is not qualified to self-diagnose. Right. You have to get some a third party who knows them very well. But the obvious problem there is it's usually the spouse. And so if you ask the spouse, honey, do you think I'm addicted? If she says yes, then the guy probably gets mad because he disagrees because she's also addicted. And then he'll turn around and say, well, you're just as addicted to your social media as I am my games. But the reality is if the smart person who is humble, the smart person will actually ask that question to, to the people closest to them and let them honestly speak into their lives. And then you will know, because when we are addicted, as you know, Mike, we're blind to our own sins. Not, not fully. Most people, I think, intuitively know they're addicted, but to the degree that they are, they'll deny. That's, that's the classic hallmark of an addict is denial, self-justification. And so it takes someone from the outside to challenge them, hopefully with grace and love, uh, the grace and love of Jesus, but they have to be challenged. And then right. it, the, the smart person will submit to someone else who's in control. So the person who is addicted, I have met a number of people over the years who will definitely come up to me and say, you know what? I'm in sin. I'm horribly addicted. And, and, you know, they, they can be helped pretty quickly, but the vast majority of people, especially children, that there, there has to be an intervention and we could do an entire show, an entire podcast just on the lack of parenting and how it's changed in one generation. And mm -hmm. it's now the kids raising the parents is really what's happened. It's just reversed instead of the parents being parents. But that's another subject. Mm -hmm. So we have a situation now where we 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 don't have enough clinics like if you go to south korea south korea has 400 digital detox rehabilitation yeah. centers mm -hmm. there were 200 when i wrote the book but it's up to 400 now and some of the best detox information comes out of those you know the research is being done in asia 
because we don't we don't recognize it here. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that's used here as the diagnostic criteria does not recognize digital addiction, addiction, but the other side of the world does. And so you can get a lot of help there, but not so much here. Uh, so when you check into a clinic over there, they have the diagnostic criteria. They, they can hook you up to machines and they can scan your brain and they make all this available. And they'll just say, well, yeah, you're addicted. This is what it looks like. But here you're hard pressed to have that done. It, we need to have that here as well. Well, I'll tell you one, one thing. I, I can't remember if I read it in your book or another another material I read. I'd have to go back and research it out real quick. But I remember uh, one, of, one of you uh, you professionals uh, in this area talking about the fact of talking with a parent of a child when they took their uh, screens away from them, they became combative, almost angry. Mm-hmm. And 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 uh, having to you know, so almost like they were withdrawing from a, a drug of its own, you know, mm-hmm. like a cocaine drug. It's just amazing how it can have an effect on people. Um, I want us to get into something. We talk a little bit about churches here, uh, how it's benefiting and harmful to our churches a little bit in the internet world. We got we're, we're we're coming up on our time here, and I want us to spend a little bit of time here if we could. Internet uh, churches, especially in the last year, has really had to uh, move towards, I won't say they had to, but they have moved towards uh, uh, using the Internet a lot more than they ever have before. And uh, Mm -hmm. churches going FaceTime and and uh, putting their services online. How has the Internet kind of benefited the churches uh, in uh, in the spreading of the Gospels and the things that they're doing? Well, it has definitely benefited, Mike. Um, but the problem, I saw this statistic, or I heard this statistic from a friend and I've not been able to track down the source. I'm a little hesitant to tell you this without being able to document it. Cause in my, in the world of academics, I have to footnote everything. Footnoting takes the joy out of life, but it's, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> but it's necessary. I understand that. I do understand that. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and give this to you because I believe it to be, to be true. And I believe the the minister that I got this from, he did hear it, and I believe he heard it correctly. When the pandemic started, and a lot of churches already have an, already had a digital infrastructure to stream, so they were good to go. But but tons of money has been invested to either enhance that or to begin it. Churches that did not have streaming technology invested lots of money quickly and did that. And, and it's been beneficial. I mean, during lockdown, Beth and I sat up here in our living room, watched our church services, and we worshiped and we prayed, and it was good. But the stat that I heard that I actually believe is true, after some time went on, it turns out, according to this statistic, only 6% of the people who started watching a sermon from their church in their living room, only 6% finished it. Mm-hmm. So of all the people who started it, the vast majority got distracted. Now, what I suspect, of course, they had their phones with them and they were taking calls and they were surfing and they were because there was nobody there to watch over them. There's nobody in a pew next to them or a chair next to them to stay. I can see that happening. (laughs) Yes. So while the while the theory is good and I'm sure six percent were enormously blessed uh, and there are those of us who are disciplined not to take our phones to the living room. I've become disciplined not to do that. I've been blessed. So I don't want to say it's not, it's been a, a, a complete failure, but it's not been, it's not caused revival in America by any stretch. We talked about this earlier. One in Barna has released those stats. One up to one in five, up to 20% of our churches could close never to reopen again. But if the trend continues. So the internet, with all the streaming has not preserved the church. It's not, uh, it's revealed the weaknesses is what they're saying. Um, You know, the house was built on sand and the winds have come and it it, it came down with a mighty crash. And then of course, those churches that were built on the rock, um, they're holding out strong giving is up in many cases, but it's, it's not been all that great. Um, just to be perfectly honest with you. So I would say, Mike, I'm not against it. You and I, what you and I are doing right now is wonderful. Uh, And I can't wait for the day for this pandemic to be over so I can come down and be with you. That would be better. But in the meantime, I'm going to get you on my podcast because it's Mm -hmm. a good thing. And we need to get these messages out there and we will continue to do it after the pandemic's over, but it would be better to be there, but it has not been the panacea it, it, I don't want to put it all down. The streaming of the church services is nobody's gotten addicted to it. So I'm not going to put it in the same classification as pornography, of course. 
so it, it's just not been overwhelmingly beneficial, although it's for some, for a handful, it has been. Right. Right. I understand. And, um, uh, well, let me ask you this. You spoke a little bit about this, but I want you to dive into it a little bit more when it's still dealing with our churches. How has it harmed the church? The pornography rates have gone up just like it has in the world. I mean, the amount of the numbers of pornography, there's a group up here in Virginia. We're not that far from you. We're just north of you. In Lynchburg, yeah. Virginia, where Liberty University is located, there's a ministry there called Proven Men. It's now called Proven Ministries oh, yeah. because they yeah. it started it started off just being for men, but the amount of women who are addicted to porn is so great now. They've had to add a wing called Proven Women, and uh, the, their meetings pack out. And so, what has happened to the church? The internet has has brought in pornography, and if we don't deal with that, I contend. You know, sin still separates us from God, and God is just on the other side of that sin, so willing to forgive us, so willing to welcome us back. But there's this big unspoken of, I mean, in the American church compared to, say, Africa, where they'll ask me to preach on pornography on Sunday morning. And I mean, be very, you know, real and not, you know, whitewash it. Here in this country, you'll often get things like, well, how are you going to word it? Don't talk about that. We'll save that for the men's meeting. Or, yeah. And we should save it for the men's meeting. But as a result of going year after year after year, you know, of toning things down and being, you know, seeker friendly and that sort of thing, we're paying a terribly heavy price right now. So the Internet, there's not been any holiness preaching. Uh, and, and there's a difference between that and legalism. That's the last thing I want to do is put legalism into this, Mike. I, I believe separation is the best the scriptural New Testament separation from sin as opposed to just bashing people upside the head because at the end of the day we want to see people come back but because the pendulum has swung in general to the hyper grace there's not been a standard there was no standard when all this hit us right. um, in fact it was encouraged because now we're cool we're free and we right. are thank god right. but we're a little too free because we've overlooked some of the new test i mean the new testament commands of jesus which is not legalism, but we've confused the two. Now, that's Brad preaching here. That's the preacher in me coming out. So it has harmed us equal to the, to, to, to the world, and that's why those shocking numbers of 20%, up to 20% of the churches could close in America never to reopen. And and a big chunk of that, of course, is, is due to the Internet. We have other theological issues. We have wokeness in the church as well oh, and all yeah. that now that we're dealing with. But, Mike, where are they, where are they propagating their message? The Internet, that's how wokeness mm -hmm. is. That's how they're getting their message out, just like the rest of us. So it's been good where the streaming can help us uh, communicating and having our board meetings. I just had a board meeting with my African board yesterday and it was a South African board. It was just very encouraging. It's been good for that. But in terms of the entertainment media, it is harming us to a very large degree. Right. All right. Well, uh, you know, one of the things I remember reading, uh, over a decade ago, it was over a decade ago, uh, Chuck Swindoll dealing with pornography made a statement saying it was probably, didn't know probably about it. He said it was the number one secret sin in our church pews today. And that mm -hmm. was over 10 years ago dealing with pornography. And I remember reading a, a statistic that uh, Bonner Research did, even about that same time, that said five out of 10 men in our churches were addicted to pornography. That number is probably in the seven to eight range now of 10 men. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised with that at all. It is. It it's is it's over 70 percent and over 50 percent of our pastors and about 60 yeah. percent of our youth pastors. Yeah, it, it's, it's just amazing how the Internet has um, uh, uh, has attacked us in that way, so to speak. Well, Brad, I tell you what, it's been fun. And uh, we're coming up on our time. And, and one of the things I do want to give you time to do is tell people how they can get up with you, because I'm sure some of our listeners have probably either been piqued with some of this information and uh, interested with it and like to uh, contact you, maybe have you at, the, at their church. So uh, give you a, take a few minutes and just explain how they can get up with you so you can reach out to them and talk to them some more. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that, Mike. I have a website. My name is Brad Huddleston, B-R-A-D, and my last name is H-U-D-D-L-E-S-T-O-N. So it's all one word, bradhuddleston.com, and you'll see a shop 
button up at the top. You can find the book there. You can find I have a, a podcast uh, just like you do. And and be sure to check that podcast because Mike's going to be on mine soon, too. Uh, but, you know, we release. As I get the information to you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll harass you. I'm good at that. But, I'll, but you'll enjoy it because I'm nice about it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so bradhuddleston.com, all the, the materials that we talked about there, there's links, of course, to the podcast. And, and I, I'm tomorrow I will be on uh, vision radio. I, I have a long history in Australia. I'm the tech, one of the tech, I'm the tech commentary as far as I know on the vision radio network. And so we will have uh, a long interview on about 720 stations tomorrow. That'll be on there. And I just try to keep my finger on the pulse of what's happening. Cause I want to bless the body of Christ. I want to bring, you know, information that's going to be helpful and freeing to people. That's the main thing. We talk about all this darkness, Mike, but my heart is not to condemn people who have fallen into sin. I've done that myself. I just want to pass along the goodness that God has, has given to me and what he's done in my life. And so please understand my heart. But bradhuddleston.com is where it's, it's the aggregate for everything that I do. So all the appropriate links and the shops and all that sort of stuff is there. So thanks for letting me mention that. Okay. Well, Brad, it's been good having you on today and you provide a lot of information. It's really seen tens of maybe some people will not just listen to this uh uh, podcast once, but they'll listen to it two or three times so they can so they can grasp everything that you have shared with you because you've talked about a lot of stuff here that we really, as uh, as dads, as granddads, as as uh, basically parents in general, as uh, members of churches, we need to understand the effects that it's having on our families and having on our culture and and how we as as a church can help the help each other to overcome this uh, this problem of digital addiction. Uh, I really do appreciate that. So if you need uh, need more, more contact, if you want to talk to Brad some more about it, as he said, he has a website. It's out there on bradhuddleson.com, so reach out to them. If you want to reach out to me and talk to me and find out more information about Cape Fear Men, you can reach out to me by going by sending me an email at mike.sandlin at capefearmen.net. So join us next time on Intentional Conversations as we continue to speak to men's leaders about ministering to men. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Intentional Conversations with Mike Salen. Intentional Conversations is a production of Cape Fear Men and Men's Ministry Coalition. In case you missed something or would like to review something said, this conversation will be available on the Cape Fear Men website within the next few days. Just go to capefearmen.net slash podcast to listen. You can also find us on iTunes and Spotify, and you will be able to listen to past podcasts. If you enjoyed today's program, I would like to ask you to consider helping us keep these broadcasts coming to you by donating to Cape Fear Men by either going to capefearmen.net and clicking on the donate button at the top of the page, or text CAPE, C-A-P-E, to 50155. Cape Fear Men is a 501c3 organization, and all donations are tax deductible. Thank you in advance for your donations. If you have other questions, drop us an email at capefearmen at gmail.com. Again, Intentional Conversations is a program where a men's ministry leader interviews leaders in men's ministry. Now, as a beloved mentor used to say, after finishing our time together, I pray God will give you the rock to stand on, a brook to drink from, and a tree to shake your back. Join us next time on Intentional Conversations. God bless.